All right, this is the beginning of our second half of our discussion on energy resources. So the first half we concentrated on fossil fuels. This half we're going to look at nuclear energy first, and then we're going to look at our renewable energy sources. So let's begin with nuclear energy. Now, remember um, in the U.S. what our energy use looks like. 80% uh, goes to fossil fuels, about 9% goes to nuclear energy, and about 11% goes to our renewables. Now, the primary energy source that we utilize for nuclear energy is radioactive isotopes, primarily uranium, but thorium can be used as well. Now, this is what we do. We utilize a process called nuclear fission, the splitting of radioactive isotopes, and this is how it works. Take a look at this animation in the top right hand. What we do is we shoot a neutron at a uranium-235 isotope. It hits it, causes it to split into two end products, and that entire reaction generates an enormous amount of energy in the form of heat. We then utilize that heat to turn water into steam to turn a turbine to generate an electrical current. Now I want to stop here for a second guys and think about how we generated electricity with let's say a coal-fired power plant. What did we do? We burned the coal, we took that heat energy to turn water into steam and the steam then turned a turbine. It's the same process, guys. The only difference is where we get the heat. In the example of a coal-fired power plant, we get the heat from burning of coal. In a nuclear power plant, we get the heat from this fission process. Now, you've probably heard the other term called nuclear fusion or cold fusion. We have been working on cold fusion for decades. What that is, and, and this is what fusion is, this is how the stars, like our sun, generate energy. It takes two hydrogen atoms, crushes them together at incredibly high pressures and incredibly high temperatures to generate a helium atom and an enormous amount of energy. That's fusion. Cold fusion is trying to replicate that process on or at the Earth's uh, near surface temperature. As of right now, it seems that cold fusion is out of our reach. Okay? The only way that works is at incredibly high pressures, at incredibly high temperatures that are generated within the interiors of stars. So we don't use fusion, we use fission, the splitting of radioactive isotopes. Now, here's what is called the nuclear cycle so before we can generate energy the first thing we have to do for is mine for uranium or thorium the good news is a lot of african nations have fairly large deposits of uranium and thorium that can be mined the second process right here guys mark three here is we have to stabilize it uranium by its very nature is unstable and so we bond it with fluorine. So this UF6, this is essentially the stabilization process. We then enrich it. The higher the grade or the enrichment of the uranium or thorium, the more energy we can get out of it. We then create fuel rods. I'll show you what those look like here in a couple minutes. We then take the fuel rods, stick them in the reactor core where they're good for about three to five years. After that time period, after that, that lifespan of these rods, we can actually recycle a little bit of that radioactive material to make new fuel rods. However, most of that goes to the most important step of this entire process, which is waste storage. Now, those rods are going to be radioactive for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. The key concept or the key step of this entire cycle, guys, is finding a suitable storage location where those rods can be kept out of the way. Now, here is how we generate electricity. So here's our reactor core where the fuel rods are located. Through the fission process, we generate heat 
the heat turns water to steam, the steam then turns a turbine. Here are these fuel rods, and I know they don't look like much, guys, but these little black pellets appear are enriched stabilized uranium. So we take these pellets, we stick them into one of these fuel rods, and often these fuel rods are grouped together, usually anywhere between 20 and 30. They're put in this device right here, and then this device goes right into our nuclear core. Now if we take a look at our most of our nuclear energy sites, you'll notice something. Most of our nuclear energy sites are located in the upper Midwest, Illinois, Wisconsin, even Iowa, Michigan, or on the East Coast. There is a reason for that, guys. Remember when we talked about active versus passive coasts. Think about it, guys. What do we have over here on the West Coast? We have a plate boundary, right? We have a convergent plate boundary up here that then um, turns into a transform plate boundary down here. Do you want to put a nuclear power plant right next to a plate boundary, right next to an active coast? Of course you don't, ladies and gentlemen, which is why, remember, the boundary on the East Coast isn't here, guys. It's in the middle of the Atlantic. So passive coast, much lower energy, much safer place to build a nuclear power plant. Now, before we get to the disadvantages, and we will, let's talk about the advantages. Just like we did with fossil fuels, guys. We started with the pros, and then we went to the cons. So, nuclear energy, what are the advantages? First off, we have fairly large deposits globally of both uranium and thorium. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that one day we're not going to run out of these, because we will. Remember, nuclear energy, just like fossil fuels, is a non-renewable energy source. Finite amount of uranium and thorium. The safety records in the U.S. are pretty good. We have always respected the power of the atom, guys. Now, there is one exception. The Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania had a small leak back in 1979. Now, I don't want you to get confused, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about the disadvantages, obviously, with, with an accident. But Three Mile Island was more of a whoops. You know, Chernobyl was, oh shit, run for your lives. But Three Mile Island was more of a whoopsie. So, yes, nuclear um, material was leaked, but it was a fairly small leak. Okay, So, we have always respected the power of nuclear energy. It's an efficient source of energy. Much higher BTU content than fossil fuels. Remember BTU, guys, British Thermal Unit, which is essentially a measure of energy content. One kilogram, that would be a thousand grams of uranium, contained 20,000 times more energy than a thousand grams of coal. That's not a small difference, guys. 20,000 times more energy. Orders of magnitude more energy. Now, here's the biggest advantage, guys. Think about it. Are we generating CO2 gas? Are we burning anything, guys? We're not, are we? So from a pollution standpoint, we're not generating CO2 gas. We do generate a little bit of water vapor, and as we found out, water vapor, yes, is a greenhouse gas, guys, but we're not burning anything, and so we're not producing CO2 or CH4, our methane gases. So as far as the greenhouse effect in global warming, this is a much more environmentally friendly energy source. And believe it or not, uranium mines are much safer than coal mines. There have been way more coal miners that have died than miners uh, mining for either uranium or thorium. Now, on the other hand, guys, let's talk about the other, uh, other side of the coin, the disadvantages. And the biggest one is what happens if there's an accident. That's the biggest disadvantage of nuclear energy, guys. From a public safety perspective, everybody is afraid of nuclear energy because they don't want another Chernobyl, okay? Chernobyl was the disaster that happened back in 1986 in Russia. They were using an outdated um, core safety containment technology, 
which came to bite them in the ass. Okay, so they, they were using outdated technology. It failed releasing a huge amount of radioactivity into the surrounding countryside. So Chernobyl was a technically a disaster. Three Mile Island was, as I said, more of a whoopsie. We didn't mean to do that. Now the other one that people think of is the, the latest one that happened in Japan, the Fukushima plant in 2011. Now that wasn't caused by human error. That was caused by a 9.2 or 9.1, I forget the magnitude, earthquake that created a huge tsunami within a matter of about five or ten minutes which hit the east coast of Japan and unfortunately the Fukushima reactor was right on the coast. So the tsunami hit the reactor, damaged it, causing a release of radioactive material. But that's really the, the biggest problem. From a public perspective, guys, it's what happens if we have another accident? What happens if we have another Chernobyl? Much higher costs as far as the design and construction of nuclear power plants. Remember, guys, from a safety perspective, we want to make sure that absolutely no radioactivity um, goes off site. So obviously it's going to cost a lot more to construct them. The other big problem, and once again this goes back to fear, is radioactive waste. What do we do when those spent fuel rods come out of that core? How can we properly isolate them and store them away from humans so that it's going to be safe? Remember, those rods still radioactive hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years. And then once again, the last one is this, this fear thing, guys. If you, if you say to the general public, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy? The first thing they think about is maybe the atom bomb, or what happens if terrorists get a hold of, of nuclear material, or what happens if we have another Chernobyl. The biggest disadvantage of nuclear energy is the ignorance of the general public, guys. They think that if you build a nuclear power plant, everybody that's around that plant is going to start growing extra limbs or an extra head. That just isn't the case, guys. We have always respected the power of nuclear energy. If we were to build a nuclear power plant outside of Las Vegas tomorrow, I would be absolutely fine with it, guys, because I understand the protocols. There is an actual law, guys, that sets forth the protocols on how to dispose of, of nuclear waste. And we're going to talk about that here in a couple minutes. Okay, So it's not like we can ignore them. We have to follow the rules. But that's the biggest problem. Um, there's this acronym called NIMBY, ladies and gentlemen, not in my backyard. And that's the problem with nuclear energy. Everybody wants the electricity from it, but nobody wants the power plants near them because they're afraid, once again, goes back to that fear, afraid of the consequences. And this is generally why we have not built any new power plants over the last 40 years. I think the last one built was the late 70s, guys. I'm pretty sure none have been built 80s or going forward. Now, let's talk about the waste, guys. What do we do? So, as I mentioned before, those fuel rods have an, have an average lifespan of anywhere between three and five years. As soon as they come out of the core, they get put into what are called these spent fuel pools. You can see a picture up here at the top. Each of these um, little uh, cylinders, guys, um, rectangular cylinders, is holding one spent fuel rod. So what we do is we stick them in these pools to decrease their radioactivity. And we leave them in there for about five years. Okay. So once again, essentially we're cooling them off. These very, very hot rods that come out of the cores after all this fission, we put them in these pools to cool them off, to decrease their radioactivity. We then take these spent fuel rods and we stick them into something called dry casts. Here's this picture down below guys. So we actually have an inner stainless steel container right here where we stick the spent fuel rods. 
we then take that inner stainless steel container and we stick it in another larger stainless steel container kind of like those rushing nesting dolls guys uh, and so and then we fill the empty space between the two containers with concrete all of that is for safety protocol guys the inner stainless steel container the concrete the outer stainless steel container are all acting as a shield for anybody working around those dry casts for any lingering radioactivity that may be present that's shielding the humans that are working around these things so once again we take extra safety precautions an inner stainless steel container goes into an outer stainless steel container and then the empty space gets filled up with concrete we then we store these um, dry casts in what are called a deep geological repositories the only active site in the US guys is this pictured right here it's called the whip site the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico now generally when we're looking for suitable locations for this nuclear waste we want igneous we want metamorphic or we want salt beds the reason for that guys is think about it igneous and metamorphic rocks are crystalline you're not going to get any water that's being that's going to be transmitted through them which means we don't have to worry about water getting in the dry casts and creating liquid nuclear waste okay so we're looking for a specific type of geologic environment a depositional environment where we're going to get these conditions now I want to point out this picture up here guys so at the surface we have our administration buildings now the dry casts are actually stored about 2200 feet below the earth surface what they did is they actually carved out artificial caverns you can see one of these caverns down here guys by the way here are these dry casks so they carved out these these artificial caverns and that's where the dry casts are stored so it's not like we just have them laying around at the earth's surface we're storing them in these artificial casks deep below the earth's surface the whole purpose for nuclear waste guys the one word that we have to make sure we do is to isolate the waste that's the purpose here now remember all of these things these spent fuel pools the dry casts the deep geological repositories are all put forth are all outlined in I, I think it's called the nuclear waste disposal act that was passed in 1982 so once again there's a law on the books telling us how we have to get rid of this waste now I say that the whip site is the only active site in the US for those of you that live in Nevada you probably have heard about y Yucca Mountain now Yucca Mountain if you're unfamiliar it's a mountain range about a hundred miles northwest of where I am currently sitting in Las Vegas now we have been studying Yucca Mountain since the early 70s and as of 2008 so after about four decades of research the US had spent about nine billion dollars researching the feasibility of Yucca Mountain now here's what we did guys we took um, nuclear scientists from across the US we also invited nuclear scientists from across the globe we invited the very best please come here check on the on the feasibility and from a scientific side guys Yucca Mountain was perfect think about it Yucca Mountain is composed of a hard igneous rock called a tough so once again great depositional environment and think about it guys Nevada we have very very low rainfall average rainfall is about eight inches per year but since we've been in this drought since 2000 we're actually getting about four four and a half so from a climatic perspective and from a geologic perspective Yucca Mountain was perfect now the facility was built it was supposed to open by January of 98 but is not has not accepted one single spent fuel rod and that goes back to that acronym guys here's that NIMBY not in my backyard 
um, the former senator, Harry Reid, along with a large contingent of people from Las Vegas and Reno, kind of rose up and said, we don't want you to store high-level nuclear waste in our state. And so this is why it was scrapped. Yucca Mountain does store low-level biomedical waste, but has not accepted a single fuel rod. Even though, guys, if Yucca Mountain opened, it would have meant billions of dollars for our state. I don't know, money that we could have put towards, I don't know, education, ladies and gentlemen. Instead of being 50th or 49th or even 48th as far as education, we could actually spend money on our educational system. But once again, it goes back to that fear, guys. Hey, uh, we don't want you to store waste because I don't want to grow a third arm, even though that isn't what happened. Okay, A lot of people, unfortunately, get that from the Simpsons, guys. And unfortunately, we lost... Uh, we lost out on an opportunity, especially for money here. All right, let's turn our attention now to our renewable energy sources. Now, both fossil fuels and nuclear energy, guys, are non-renewable energy sources. They depend on things that are finite in quantity and will eventually run out one day. Our renewable energy sources these can be replenished again and again and again and again and never be in danger of running out. The other advantage, guys, we'll talk about disadvantages later, but the other advantage is they generally, not always, but generally have lower environmental impacts than fossil fuels. Now, remember at the beginning of this, guys, I said that there was an order. We're going to talk about the five most widely used renewable energy sources in decreasing order. So if we go over here, guys, the most widely used of our renewable is biomass. About 45% of our renewable energy budget, which is about 11%, guys, is biomass. Followed by hydroelectric is second. Wind is right behind at third. Solar is about 8% and geothermal is about 2%. So we're going to um, talk about these in order, guys, in decreasing use in the U.S. And I'm also going to end up, I'm going to talk about a couple others that aren't on this list. Uh, tidal power and wave power are generally not widely used in the U.S. There are sites uh, across the globe but generally, there's a lot of disadvantages, and we'll talk about them when we get there. So we'll talk about the five most widely used first, and then I want to talk about some others as well. Now, where you live is going to depend uh, or is going to drive what type of renewable energy source you use. Pretty much everything, the eastern half of the U.S., guys, is pretty much only biomass. That's the green coloration that you see here. Our plain states, from Texas up into the Dakotas, you'll see the blue, that's where wind energy is economic. So the winds, as they come rushing down off the Rocky Mountains, makes wind feasible there. Out here in the southwest, guys, you'll notice Colorado, Nevada, into California, uh, solar energy, even geothermal energy, is going to be feasible. So I like to, to think of these four states, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and California. Yes, parts of New Mexico and Colorado, but these are kind of the big solar states where we get, uh, especially here in Nevada, guys, we get over 300 days of sunlight a year, and so solar energy is going to be feasible. It's going to be economical. And so let's start with our most widely used of our renewables, which is biomass. Biomass is the burning of wood, agricultural waste, or yes, even garbage. We can burn our um, municipal solid waste, guys, for energy, to produce heat, to turn water into steam, to turn a turbine. Remember when we talked about waste, guys? We talked about incineration. And I believe I mentioned biomass there. So we can burn waste. Mostly, though, biomass is burning of wood and agricultural waste. Think about it this way, guys. Let's say it's August. We live in, for whatever reason, we live in Nebraska, and we've just harvested our cornfield. 
What do we have left, ghosts? You, have you ever seen those shucks of corn left behind? Well, guess what? Those can be burned to get energy out of it. Okay. Now, there's two parts to biomass. Uh, we're going to talk about biogas first, but we're also going to talk about biofuels here in a couple minutes. Now, what biogas is, it's a mixture of gases, primarily methane gas, our CH4 gas, but there are others involved in well as well that are produced by the breakdown of organic material. So agricultural waste, manure, even garbage guys. Remember we talked about in a sanitary landfill that we're going to produce methane through this decomposition process. And what do most landfills do? They capture that methane, they burn it to generate electricity. Same thing we're doing here guys. So through the na this natural decomposition process um, by bacteria, we generate these biogases which can be captured and then burned for energy. Now, before we go on guys, and, and we're going to get into biofuels here in a minute, think about, I want you to think about the main disadvantage of this. We're burning something guys, so what are we generating? That's right, carbon dioxide gas. Yes, biomass is the most widely of our renewable energy sources, but it also has the most serious environmental consequences because we do generate carbon dioxide, which is going to lead to an enhanced greenhouse effect and global warming, which we've already talked about. So that is a problem, guys. Almost half of our renewable energy budget has very serious environmental consequences. You can see that if you take a look at this picture down here, once again, some of the states that use the most biomass are going to be our agricultural states. Think about it, guys. Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, uh, Minnesota, even into Indiana and Michigan. These are large agriculture producing states that are going to have a lot of agricultural waste that we can use. The other part of biomass are biofuels. Now, what a biofuel is, it's a fuel produced when a living organism takes non-living or inorganic ingredients and converts them into organic molecules. Now, I hope something at the back of your mind is dinging here, ladies and gentlemen, because we've already talked about a process that does this. Remember photosynthesis, guys. What do plants do? They take carbon dioxide and water and in the presence of sunlight, they create that, those simple sugars and simple carbohydrates that they then use um, for uh, reproduction, to repair tissue, to grow, whatever the plant needs. Well, here's the interesting thing, guys. We can harvest that plant material, or in some cases, animal fats can be harvested and we can actually take that material and convert it into a gasoline substitute. It's not going to be your normal gasoline that you generate through petroleum, guys. It's a gasoline-like substitute. Now, I put in the, in the fact that animal fats can be used. They generally aren't widely used. It's the plant material that gets us a little bit more energy, guys. So we generally harvest plants, but we can take animal fats and use them to convert these to these biofuels as well. Um, the two most common crops to do this, corn is number one. By far corn is the most widely used biofuel and if you've ever heard of ethanol guys, ethanol is a biofuel that's produced through corn and sugarcane is the other one. Those are the two most widely used although there is research now um, that's being done to try and um, use other plants because corn and sugarcane are actually really rough on agricultural fields. They, they tend to remove a lot of the nutrients. So there's research into other lower impact plants. Can we get the same amount of, of these biofuels out of them? Now, as oil prices continue to rise, as our dwindling supply goes down, we're going to see biofuels are going to become more and more popular. Uh, if you look in 2013, the worldwide global biofuel production reached about 34 billion gallons. Now that's impressive 
when you think, guys, biofuels have only been around since the early 80s. This is a relatively new technology, okay? Maybe the late 70s, but I, I can remember the first time hearing about biofuels was in the early 80s. So it's a relatively new science, guys. And the fact that it's reached that production that quickly tells you how uh, reliable it is. Our next, our second most widely used renewable energy source is hydroelectric energy. Now this is a fairly simple process, guys. So what you do is you dam a river. Here's our dam right here. You bring in the water behind the dam which spins a turbine which generates an electrical current. So we're leaving out a step, guys. We don't have to convert water into steam. We're simply using the kinetic energy of the flowing water to spin a turbine to then generate an AC-DC current. Now, the amount of energy a hydroelectric power plant can generate is proportional to something called the hydraulic head. And I want you to think of the hydraulic head as simply a measurement of the energy of the system. Now, what the hydraulic head is, guys, it's the difference in water level behind the dam compared to the water level in front of the dam. The greater that difference, the larger the hydraulic head, the more energy that we can get out of that hydroelectric power plant. So if you've ever been to the Hoover Dam lately, guys, you'll notice that if you look at the water level in Lake Mead, which unfortunately is declining because of the drought we're in, and the water level in the Colorado, you're, you're looking at probably a couple hundred feet. Okay, So that's a fairly good hydraulic head, a fairly good difference, which means we can generate quite a lot of energy. Now, most people think the Hoover Dam is the largest hydroelectric power plant in the U.S. That is not the case, guys. The largest one is actually, I don't know the name of it, but it's found over in California. I think the Hoover Dam, uh, it's either second or third. It's in the top three, definitely, as far as size and the amount of energy it generates. The world's largest hydroelectric power plant is in China. The um, Three Gorges Dam uh, is the largest hydroelectric power plant in the world. Now, I have taken the um, Hoover Dam tour. Uh, here's what the turbines look like, guys. The Hoover Dam has 16. You can actually count, there's eight here. There's another eight on this side that are not shown. So they have 16 turbines. On a normal day, anywhere between two and six are in operation. So the Hoover Dam does not operate at full capacity. So you spin those turbines, you generate that electrical current, and then you use these power lines to move the electricity from point to point. Now, most of that electricity from the Hoover Dam goes to California, guys. The Imperial Valley. Arizona gets a fairly big share. I think Las Vegas gets 5%, maybe 10. Yeah, I know it's less than 10% of the energy from the, from the Hoover Dam. So everybody thinks, well, the Hoover Dam's close to Las Vegas. They must get most of the energy. That's not the case. Uh, wind energy, the third most widely used. It was just behind hydroelectric. And here's what wind energy is. You have what is called the wind turbine. Okay? Or if you want to call it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated windmill where you have these turbines that spin. Now, as the wind blows through the turbines, it spins it, and the kinetic energy of the blowing wind is converted into mechanical energy. That mechanical energy can be used to drive machinery, or what's most common is that then you have another step where it's then uh, gen uh, where it's converted into electricity, into an AC-DC current. Now, the higher the wind velocity, the more the kinetic energy, the more energy that we can generate. So generally you pick spots to build what are called wind farms, where you have maybe tens or hundreds of these turbines connected by some kind of electric grid transmission network where you can move then the electricity. 
So generally you build these wind farms where you get higher sustained winds. And this is where the future is, guys. Notice this picture down here. Here's a, a relatively new wind farm that was built offshore. The reason why a lot of these wind farms are being built offshore is guess where we see the highest wind velocities? That's right, offshore. And so that's kind of where the future of wind energy is going. If you look in the US, okay, we want the reds and the blues, guys, the dark blues. That's where you see the highest velocities. Notice, where do you see the reds and the blues? Ta-da! Offshore, guys. Which is why that's where the future is. That's where you get the highest sustained winds. Now, you do have a fairly large potential in the plain states, guys. Dakota's down to Texas because of the winds coming off the Rockies. You do see some small patches of uh, red and blue here in Wyoming. And you do get some scattered patches here in California, Nevada, Utah, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and Colorado. But the future of wind is offshore because greater sustained winds, higher kinetic energy, therefore more electricity. Our fourth most widely used renewable energy source is solar energy. And this gets a lot of attention, particularly here in Nevada, guys. But we're going to see in a minute that it's the reason it has a big disadvantage of why it's not more widely used. Now, there are two types of solar. Mostly when people say solar energy, they're talking about something called active solar. In this, you're specifically using a specific type of material to build what are called photovoltaic or PV panels. You can actually see these PV panels down here, guys. Now, what these panels do, sunlight hits this material, it excites the electrons in the material. The electrons jump up to a higher energy level. Eventually, they're going to fall back down to the energy level they, they were at to begin with. When that happens, when they fall back down, that movement of electrons is what then converts it into an AC-DC current. That's active solar, guys. So you use specialized material, you excite the electrons in the material, and that I excitement can then be converted into an electrical current. Here's the problem. And, and uh, let me be honest, this might remain a problem for a long time, is that photovoltaic panels are extremely inefficient. You're talking about efficiency of anywhere between 10 and 20%. I've read that the average is around 17. So a photovoltaic panel is only 17% efficient. That's horrible, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, Yes, we're starting to see solar energy rise, but there are real limitations on active solar. Now, the other half of this is what is called passive solar. In this case, we're not generating an electrical current. All we're doing is we're using something to absorb the sunlight and then using that heat to heat something up. Here in the valley, guys, there are a lot of homes that have passive solar hot water heaters. So during the day, the hot water heater absorbs all that sunlight, uses that heat to heat the water in the tank. Or there's also a lot of uh, people with pools. They'll have a passive pool heater. So you absorb all the sunlight during the day, you then use that radiant heat to heat up your pool water. That's passive. So you're not generating an electrical current all you're doing is using the sunlight to heat something up. Now, there's a new solar technology called concentrating solar power. And I bring this up, guys. So I know these kind of look like photovoltaic panels in this picture down here. They're not. These are big mirrors. And so what happens is the sunlight hits the all these mirrors where it's then reflected to this area right here at the top of this tower in the center. Right here, guys, we have some kind of receiver which then absorbs the sunlight. 
the sunlight then that heat turns water into steam which then drives a turbine we've heard that before haven't we ladies and gentlemen now the reason why um, we're starting to hear more of this is because we don't have to mine that materials to build photovoltaic panels all we need is uh, well, essentially silica dioxide guys glass that's what mirrors or glass are made of and so this is uh, receiving a lot of attention recently uh, the problem right now is that it's more expensive than photovoltaics and so it's not being widely used but there is a pilot plant that was built outside of Boulder City Nevada a couple years ago you can actually see it on your way from from Vegas to Boulder City it's off to the right hand side there so those aren't photovoltaic panels those are all mirrors that concentrate the sunlight on a receiver that heat is then used to turn water into steam to generate an electrical current now if the prices don't come down if, if this can't compete with photovoltaics this probably won't expand but there is some potential uh, for future growth our fifth most widely used of our renewable energy sources is geothermal energy geo for earth and thermal for heat what geothermal energy is is we use the internal heat of the earth now that heat is either a left over from the formation of the planet remember guys our core is very very hot and it gives off heat remember it's that heat that drives those convective cells in the mantle that drives the movement of our tectonic plates the other um, source of heat is the decay of radioactive isotopes they can also generate heat as well now here's how this works guys here's the typical geothermal power plant usually we build them in areas where we have magma bodies close to the earth's surface that's where the heat we need is going to come from so we have this cooling magma body it gives off heat which is then going to heat groundwater producing hot water or in some cases it'll actually turn the hot water into uh, steam essentially we then drill a well into this hot water or steam we pump it out we use the hot water we turn it into steam to generate a turbine uh, to generate an electrical current okay so we, we're either using the hot water here or we might be actually extracting the steam to turn the turbine to generate the AC DC current now this entire process is driven by something called the geothermal gradient this is the difference in temperature between the earth's core which is very very hot and the earth's crust which is very cool guys so the difference in that temperature is what drives this entire process now if you look at this from a global scale you'll actually see guys that we as the US we actually use utilize the most geothermal energy of all uh, countries about 29% uh, of the global geothermal energy budget comes from us followed by the Philippines Mexico is third Indonesia is fourth and Italy is fifth now if you take a look at those five countries that have the most geothermal energy what do they all have in common guys they're very volcanically active countries and so as that magma comes close to the surface in the form of volcanism that's our heating source guys now here is our potential and I want you to notice something guys okay pretty much from the plain states east there is no potential okay these greens and blues even the yellows very very low we want the oranges the reds and the pinks and you'll notice the only place you see a pink is actually under Yellowstone guys remember we talked about hot spots that's why you see such a great potential there but we have large potential uh, Wyoming Idaho Utah even in Nevada uh, parts of California and Arizona as well because we have volcanic activity we have magma that comes close to the surface now I also wanted to talk about um, other renewable energy sources and we've already talked about tides before guys but let me bring this up again 
Remember, tides are the periodic raising and lowering of sea level that are caused by both the effects of gravity and motion between those three planetary bodies of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Now, here's the good news. Tides are much more predictable than wind or solar energy. We can't predict if we're going to have a sunny day. Okay? Well, we can. We talked about it, whether we can predict maybe upwards of two weeks. But tides are much more predictable than wind or solar energy. We know when the tides are coming in and when the tides are going out. So, much more predictable. Here's the big disadvantage, though. There are only a very limited number of sites with a sufficiently high what is called tidal range. A tidal range is the vertical difference, guys, between the high tide and the low tide. We need to maximize that tidal range. Okay, So the greater that vertical distance, the more energy that we can generate. Okay, And if you take a look at here, guys, okay, on this picture here, we want the orange and the reds. That's where the high tidal ranges are. And you'll notice, I don't see a lot of red on this map, guys. You, you do see a little red up here and some orange, but we have a limited number of sites where tidal energy is going to be economically feasible. Remember, guys, I don't think I've mentioned it during this discussion, but remember our first thought when it comes to energy is cost. We always have to think about cost. Why have we continued to use fossil fuel so much in this country and others because they're cheap guys and so the other big disadvantage a limited number of sites where this is going to be feasible but also this has been fairly expensive in the past and only when the technology improves is the cost going to come down now if you're kind of curious how this works here's how tidal energy works guys so we actually build an underwater turbine. As the tide comes in, you'll notice it pushes the water through the turbine and it spins it. The greater, the more water that's pushed through there, the more electricity that will generate. Now it also, as the tide goes out, it pushes water back the other way. So it doesn't matter whether it's coming in or going out. All we're doing is pushing water through that turbine. The more water we push through, the faster the turbine spins, the more electricity that we can generate. The other renewable energy that I want to mention is wave energy. And uh, think about the physics here for a second, guys. Think about a wave crashing on a coastline. Okay, That wave ha has mass and it moves. Therefore, it's able to generate energy. Remember the now iconic physics equation, force is equal to mass times acceleration. F is equal to M times A. And so waves crashing on a shoreline, especially big waves, they're going to generate a lot of force. And we can convert that force into electricity. Now, here's how this works, guys. Okay. What we do is we have this concrete outer housing structure right here. You can actually see that in this picture up here. So what happens, the waves during a storm crash onto this housing. It forces water underneath the concrete housing. That water then forces air through this turbine. So the more water we force into the structure, the more air we force through the turbine, the more electricity that we can generate. Now, here are the big disadvantages here, guys. Once again, it's intermittent. You're only going to generate a lot of electricity during big storms that are going to generate big waves. And so, during the rest of the time, you're going to that turbine might sit idle. So, once again, there are a limited number of sites where the waves are consistently large enough where this is economically feasible. The other thing that we have to worry about from an engineering perspective, guys, this concrete structure has to, has to stand up to the constant pounding and pounding and pounding 
of those waves. So we, we need to make sure we build it to withstand uh, that constant energy. Now, if you look at this from a global perspective, once again, there are, look at it guys, there are only a limited number of sites where you see the oranges and the reds, where you get high energy. And so once again, when we talk about renewable energy guys, the future is not tidal and is not wave energy. Generally the sites where you're going to get a lot of energy, we've already built sites there. So the potential for future growth isn't there, ladies and gentlemen, at least when it comes to tidal or wave energy. Now, as we've been going through here, we've ki I've kind of been talking about the advantages, guys. Remember, from a general perspective, renewable energy, the two best advantages are it's renewable, we can use it again and again and again, and that they generally have lower environmental consequences, except biomass, which still has fairly large ones. Let's look at the other side of the coin now, guys. What are some of the disadvantages of renewable energy? And the biggest one I have listed first, guys. Once again, I know you're tired of me saying this, but I will continue to say it. Our first consideration is always cost. And therefore, if we're deciding between, say, solar energy and continuing with our coal-fired power plants, we know the coal-fired power plants are going to be cheaper. And so generally, renewable energy has had higher costs when compared to fossil fuels. Now, those costs are coming down, guys. As the technology improves, the costs go, come down. But if you look about a decade ago, um, you're talking some renewable energy sources were either double or triple the cost of your traditional fossil fuels. That's a big deal, guys. We still have impacts from mining. Now, I know we haven't talked about um, mining of minerals yet. That's actually the next topic that we're going to talk about. But think about it, guys. We have to build those wind turbines. We have to build those photovoltaic panels. Those all require us to mine minerals out of the earth to build those things. And so just like when we talked about the extraction of fossil fuels, the extraction of minerals are going to have a lot of the same environmental consequences. Habitat destruction. If you look at wind and solar farms, especially here in Nevada, guys, or California, um, wind farms may cover tens or even hundreds of acres. As we build those wind and those solar farms, we displace a lot of native species. And we force them to look, um, to migrate, or remember the other choice was go extinct, okay? Remember what Darwin said, guys, if you can't adapt, if something forces you out of your habit, you either have to migrate and adapt somewhere else or you go extinct. So what we're seeing is a lot of habitats are being destroyed, which is causing extinction events. Land degradation. It doesn't matter, guys, if you build a coal-fired power plant or a solar plant, any artificial building or roads, or any artificial structure, you are by your very nature going to degrade the natural ecosystem. And remember guys, whenever we consume anything, but particularly when energy is, when we consume something, we produce waste, that waste escapes into the environment and causes contamination problems. And so we're still gonna have land degradation and contamination issues even with renewable energy sources. So, yeah, there's a big problem. Okay. Now, this is the end of our energy resources discussion. 